children are raised. For some of the older crowd, more conservatives, really is a travesty. I remember, and I'm not that old, not having a choice at all in what I ate. It was on the plate. I had to eat it. In fact, I don't like it. Was it in my vocabulary? I remember a time where it didn't matter what I wanted to win. So while I like Spider-Man, Batman, Superman, or whatever the case may be, when I left my house, what my mama put on me is what I was going to win. Because even the time where I would try to talk to my parents when company was over. And they would say, boy, stay out of the wrong folk business. I remember my grandmother letting me know children are best seen and not heard. And you better not try your luck. But if you did, my grandma used to say to me, I'm going to give you son a little more grace. Because what I earned was about to be a butt woman. But when she looked at my little face, she realized I'm going to give you just a little more grace. In contrast, our modern society likes to reason with their children. What do you want to eat? What do you want to win? And we'll see that in the two trains of thoughts, there really is no resolve. I can't argue with my grandmother as to why when my daughter asked for chicken nuggets, I give it to her. <laughs> because my grandmother doesn't understand that it's nothing but love and grace in my heart for my little girl. She sees the necessity for children to realize that they have not yet crossed the bounds into adulthood. And in that there is wisdom. I see that sometimes that wisdom that was displayed on me was maybe a little harsh. And so grace is what I read on my children. And so we can see in looking at these two concepts that there's benefit really to both. The contrast exists here in our text and the Hebraic culture. Children are really the bottom of the barrel when it comes to societal things. That is, they don't really have a strong impact on society. Maybe it was because modern medicine had not yet took effect. You did not know whether your child would live or die. Maybe it was because they didn't have similar. So maybe if you couldn't find food, if you didn't have enough milk, your child may die. All we can do is really surmise as to why this group of Hebraic people did not find children all the more significant. But it was arguably the most insignificant member of society. This meager member that Christ footnotes a credential for entering the kingdom. It was this downtrodden, this lonely, this insignificant infant that Christ attributes the criteria for kingdom entry. Wow. Resting within the demeanor by which this child encountered God. Wow. Our Sunday school lesson surmises that this is childhood faith or childlike faith. Pulling out the fact of an infant's absolute dependency and comparing that to our reliance on God. Yes. The writer of the lesson continues to delve a little deeper, suggesting that children do not cast judgment like adults do. Well. And though generally I would agree with all of the declarations, the two extra scriptural observations that this writer pulls out, I believe that the scripture and context as a whole pre presents much more 
than what the writer scratched the surface on. In the biblical tradition, the road on the way to adulthood can be separated into two parts. If you notice, this carries on into English. We, we look at babies who are small as infants. And we distinct between an infant and a toddler. We don't call them the same. Though they are under the scope of being children. Infant, which will be defined here as a baby who's still feeding on the breast of their mother, appears 15 times in scripture and has metaphorical insinuations or uh, connections to the spirit realm that is worth us taking note. Child, on the other hand, the term that Jesus uses, appears 52 times. And this also has cultural in the windows behind it. Linguistically, the term child is interchangeable. Whereas the term infant is specific. But both of them within the construct of the Holy Scripture mean something. The term infant, brekos, and he was often used by the prophets as a literary element to suggest a spiritual climate. I'll give you an example. In Isaiah, the use of infant playing near a cobra's den is to project peace in the coming kingdom. So it suggests a spiritual climate when it comes to the word that Christ used for children, behind it is the idea of learning. It suggests that this child is under the correction and the thumb of their parent. It is the same term Luke uses when talking about Jesus when Simon blesses him. Scholars believe that this meant that Jesus was in his tower years and not necessarily an infant. Paul uses the term as well, but when we look at metaphorical similarities between scripture and this text, we go to 1 John, 1 John 2, 1, where John speaking to adults says, my little children, as to, to imply a spiritual level of maturity. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Those who are entering into the gospel of Jesus Christ, he addresses as my little children. So we can see the two differentiating factors between infant and children, and I declare to you that there's a message in a childlike encounter in these two words. With breath folks having the spiritual climate undertones, and the word for child, patio, relating to a child in training, we come to a contrast between the two in this text. We'll see that at verse 15, they brought the breath posts on the infants. And in verse 17, Christ makes the comparison with the companion or the little children. Jesus makes a kingdom comparison to the event that is them bringing infants and to this distinguishing aspect of the patio that is children. We can even see this in our English text. The King James translator chose the term infants in verse number 15 and quotes Jesus as suffer the little children. So as we accept that little tidbit and move on, the initiating aspects of our faith contrast these two things. And what I would call every saved believer having a childlike encounter. Yeah. But what you will notice is, as you grow, sometimes you don't really care about those childhood memories. 
On one hand, we have helpless infants. On the other, learning children. And both really become distant memories as we enter into adulthood. But it was important to Christ to say, become as you were. He's speaking to a group of adults who prior to adulthood must have been infants and children. And he says, lest we become as these. The juvenile encounter or the childlike encounter is first described by a simple yearning for the person of Christ. That is, you have to yearn for who Jesus is. Yes, yes. Not as one time event, but an ever occurring process. Amen. When true interest is present, it is followed by unyielding pursuit. Amen. That is when you're really interested in something, nobody has to tell you or remind you oh to go back to it. You can see this in, in some of our music lovers. Nobody's got to remind you to at the time of Christmas turn on Old Town Christmas. Nobody's got to remind you that you're going to lose a little Barry White when you're with your lady. Nobody's got to remind you of anything when it comes to your musical interests. We can also see this in our sports enthusiasts. Nobody got to tell you the playoffs is coming up. It's not a special text message that goes out and lets you know the Super Bowl is coming. Because you're interested and invested in it, you will know it. In this case, Christ refers to the infant when he says, such as the that is such as the infants and the people that are bringing them. There is this understanding based on the word of the mouth that Christ is capable of blessing. It was common tradition for babies to be blessed by prominent rabbis. So we see here that Christ is somebody you want to be around. We don't need to know this because even now as we sit, probably a fraction of 5,000 people with a mic, yes. how hard do you think it would be to get the attention of 5,000 without one? So we know that Jesus was a person yes. that attracted and attracted people. Yes. And in the text, they're so interested that they're not worried about what will block them from getting to the feet of Jesus. Even being rebuked of the closest disciples doesn't stop these people from bringing infants. When Christ the Word is lifted up and the name is glorified, there's a summoning agent that draws you near. We see that this is the message of the church. That the spirit of the church say come. But in the hearts of every believer, there must be a yearning yes. that describes every encounter that you have with Jesus. Yes. That is, you want to know yes. actually what he's saying yes. to you. Yes. A yearning is described by a yearning. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to believe, to please him. Yes. For he that comes yes. must believe that he is. But here's this next yearning part. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's prior to the reception of the faith, the diligent pursuit. Notice that the pursuit does not regard its barriers. It doesn't care that there's no music at the service. It doesn't even care that the person who's singing can't sing a lick. What he cares about is that Jesus is magnified and glorified. The yearning must have 
with some thought. Yeah. How am I going to get to this prominent man with so many people around him? Yeah. He's yeah. teaching. Yeah. But there was a yearning that said, these helpless things yes. need a helper. Yes. And then the childlike encounter being described by the yearning, yes. it's defined by a humble presentation. Coming to the understand, the standing that all I need is a little more grace. The image being brought to Christ by an external power, an unseen and unspoken power. Surely we do not believe that infants can get up and walk. So brought, they were brought by someone. This mirrors the divine interception of our souls. That is, no man cometh unto me except the Father. Yes. Draw him. And the promise is I will raise him up the last day. That is absent the drawing power of God. Yes. There is no coming to the man and person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. It wasn't gained your salvation. It was given. Yes. It wasn't earned our salvation. It wasn't out. It wasn't something you or I picked up. It was something Jesus put out. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who realize that God chose and carried you to the feet of Jesus. Humility is a product of understanding that we are saved by grace through faith. And not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. We are as infants in the realm of salvation. And just as infants fully depend on external factor of their parents for survival, so we do depend on the finished work of Jesus Christ for salvation. The initiating aspect of faith is birthed out of a childlike encounter, which is defined by a humble presenting of self and described by a strong yearning for who God is. Last but not least, it is distinguished by a naive acceptance of divine blessing. There's no conclusive aspect of this text. What I mean by that is we have no clue what the blessing of Jesus did for these infants. We don't know what was the product of their life due to being blessed by the hand of a senior. We don't know that. It's not conclusive. It's not there. And now we have the message. We are not often sure as to what exactly coming to Christ does practically in our day-to-day -day life. The last person that you share the gospel with, you may not know that they received it. The last person you show love to, you may not know how that helped them at a different time in their life. The next time you hug your neighbor in church, you're not certain as to how God will use that hug to prove someone out of the death. So in the blessings of God, there is a mysterious fascination as to the fact that just how God uses the small monster seed produce much gain. God can use a small instance of our lives to impact the world. But in fact, if we were to look at scripture, the Hebrew 11 lineup of faith suggests men following in the mysterious blessings of the Most High. 
Not see the complete manifestations of how God would work through them. Abraham when told to get up and move to a place that would be shown, did not know what that place was. Abraham yet again, when told he would have children, didn't understand how what turned into the multitude of stars that was promised. Abraham yet again, when told to sacrifice his son, did not see a lamb until he was already operating in that faith mode. Yes, yes, yes. And the conclusion of, of Abraham and some of other people in the scripture according to Hebrews 11 rests in verse number 13. These all died in faith not having received the promises yes. but having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Yeah. We do not know the full scope by which God will bless us when we kneel before Christ. But we do have the problem, the promise, that such yes. is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. That is when I kneel before Christ, there is a blessing of inheritance that's deposited into my life. Amen. Here, Christ elevates these blessed recipients to be an influential model of how we should approach Christ. Christ's expectations. A child in training. Little children in need of a trainer. We see Christ do something similar, little sheep, yes. in need of a shepherd. Yes. We see him use something with the Holy Ghost, martyrs, in need of a comforter. Yes, Doesn't appear coincidental that Christ at the moment of teaching uses a cultural term for learner as one of aspiration. But we know that there's a difference between a child learning and an adult learning. In the blessings of my life, God has opened the door for me to learn Hebrew. While I was in Monterey, California, studying Hebrew, I understood yet again the frustration of wanting to say something and not having the words to say it. And for adults, this is stressful. But for children, it doesn't seem to be a problem to them. In fact, whatever name you give, what they want, they'll use it. If you call a pacifier a baby, best believe that child catches on fast and says baby. If you want to make yourself move instead of mom, best believe your child will learn it real quick. It doesn't matter how many times they mess it up. As long as you get what they say, they don't care. There's a difference because there's an acceptance of truth and correction and children that's not present in adults. When you correct a child even with a quick pop, they cry, but they're not mad. Did you notice that? They cry and they're more concerned with you loving them again than the wrong that they did. It's more important for them that you hug and kiss them again. Amen. Then you lead them to wallow in the guilt of their correction. Amen. They just accept it. The temptation is to think by some allotment of time that we arrived 
completely in our Christian walk. That is that we don't have any more room to grow. The moment when the disciple openly rebukes the will of God without consulting God, he must be corrected. Can you imagine sitting next to Jesus, someone wanting not to get to you, but to Jesus, and you not even consulting to see whether or not he wants to see them? There's no discourse between the disciples and Jesus in this text. They just believe because they know there's no way Jesus will bless these little children. We're too busy. We got too much going on. How often is this a mirror to our lives? Too busy to see what Christ really wants. Too haughty and prideful to consult the king. And it comes a little voice in our brain that says, I got this. I know what you want, God. I know how you want me to move. I know it all. Sit back. I got this. And what Jesus says to him is, no. You actually don't. Jesus says, something little children will come. And he takes this moment to humble the proud. To say, disciples, I know you've been fishermen. I know you got occupations. I know you have lived a little while. I know that you're even following me. Who's going to guide you in the truth? But look at this little child as an example. How they are in need of someone to bring them to me. Yes. And how that expresses a yearning for who I am. Look at the little children. Take note of what they're doing. Yes. That they're not too proud to still be blessed even though they don't know what that blessing entails. As we grow in Christ, we want to see some They know, I'm not doing that. Give me a sign. God may tell you to love your job. Well, I'm not leaving my job for I see nothing. God said, get up and move, you and your family, somewhere else. I don't know where I'm going. I ain't going. And this is what we as humans classify as mature wisdom. That we might know the provisions before we react to the provider. A great alliteration of this is how us as men, I'm not even going to say us, y'all may not have a problem for that. Me as a man would like for me and my wife to agree on everything. It's not going to happen. Because there's been some times where I've made some not so wise decisions. And she'll say, honey, you don't need to be spending money on that. And in my spirit, I grow up and say, I can spend money on whatever I want. <laughs> so sometimes men have that problem, right? Well, I, I'm going to provide it anyway. I'll make sure that we have enough money. You don't worry about that. I know what I'm doing. And we get mad at our wives for doing that to us. And sometimes, if you're real proud, for, for a devotional, conversational purpose, you'll bring up a scripture and say, you know, honey, wives ought to submit to their husbands. Right? And what we forget, though, is this is 
a symbol for how the church should submit to Christ. Yes, yes. And sometimes we as men are expecting a submissive spirit from our wives while we have a prideful spirit to God. When it comes to who is ultimately in control, sometimes we as men don't want to kneel. All right. Okay, now. Mm. That may not be we as men, that may just be me. Mm. All right. But we cannot uphold the symbol without falling in line with the Holy Ghost structure. Yeah. That is, that the head of man is Christ. Yes. And sometimes the message needs to be projected. If you're not submitting to Christ, All right. I'm not even going to go there. All right. If you think you can outprovide God, All right. anybody will be remiss to follow a man who thought he can outthink God. Outwork the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, I, I digress. Moving on. It's a difference between the child and the adult when it comes to instruction and receiving what God is telling us in the moment of truth. We feel guilty and judged when we're instructed, when we're corrected, when we're held to a standard. And so we just justify those standards right away. But you'll notice the child, no matter how many times they get it wrong, and how many times you correct them, as long as you show them in love, they're good. Sometimes the children get it, and sometimes they don't. Some lessons take longer, and sometimes they don't. But the child not look at the correction as being a bad thing. You will notice that if a child likes a person, they want that person all the time. If they like a food, they ask for that food, beg for it all the time. If they like a movie or a book, they want to watch it or read it all the time. There's an all the time aspect of childlike interests, which means to the child, it don't ever get old. Whenever we do something that a child finds interesting, you know it because they ask you to do it again. They enjoy the repetition, that fact, and experiencing it led me to ask the question, why? Why do children like repetition? And the general consistency of the why is that children like repetition because everything around them is new. And when they experience something that they're interested in, they want you to repeat it until they get it. So as you're repeating it, as you're rereading the story, they're noticing something different because what they're interested in is vast enough Intrigue their mind. There's a message here. That is, every time they watch the movie, every time they read the book, they see and notice something a bit different. Because all the information is new, they experience something new every single time. And their disinterest normally suggests either they understand it completely or they were distract distracted. If they're interested in learning something, their interest goes when they feel they have mastered it or when they become distracted by something else. When they mastered it or reached maturity or when they've been distracted 
by saying, are we still interested in Jesus? Are we still interested in the message of the gospel? Are you still interested in the story that in the beginning was the Word? The Word was God. And the Word was with God. Are you still interested in the story that came into his own? And his own received him not, but as many as received him. Then he gave the power to become the children of God. Are we still interested? That whosoever always feels interested. When a child sees that scripture, they learn something new. For God, wait a minute, there's God. So love, wait a minute, he's loving. That he gave, so wait a minute, he's giving his only begotten son. There's another one. That whosoever believes in him, something's about to happen. Shall not perish. There goes the promise. But have ever not. If we're interested yes. in that story, the line of reasoning goes, either you fully understood it or you're distracted, which is why we're not pursuing it. And everyone must come as a believer yes. to the truth of who they are in Christ. Are we distracted? Are we disinterested? Or do we believe that we understand the broad scope of who God is? It's probably the most scary. Are we tired of the story that Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified, is not here for he risen as he said no nope, I'm not tired when it comes to that story of like a child he who was crucified he's not dead wait let's do it again he who was killed like a thief now lives like a king wait do it again he who was buried broke out of the way wait a one more time he was down he got up he was exalted he was resurrected. Do it again. Just as sure as he died, he now lives. Do it again. He was crucified. Is not dead. I'm still interested in the gospel. I'm still yearning for our Savior. And I'm accepting his word. And as a child, all you need to do when we encounter God like a child is repeat what you heard. You know how the parents speak based on how the toddler speaks. You know the word that they have been interacting with, whether it be through music, movies, people, the babysitter, the parents, based on how they use words in the beginning of them talking. Yes. If a little toddler curse, it's probably like somebody else curse. And a little toddler is using words that are higher than their brain capacity, it's probably because those are the words they were introduced. Yeah. Children speak yeah. what they hear. Yeah. And I heard yeah. that I am a shepherd.
Maybe we are not yet children because we are not interested in the gospel, but maybe we are not yet children because we're not, we're too proud to fall in love with the aspects of God we don't understand. Maybe the aspects of God we don't understand is scary because it's so vast. Maybe we don't move because we don't know the outcome. We want to know the outcome before we commit to the word. We want to know how does this apply to my life tomorrow before we accept what God says as true. We want to know how does the broad knowledge that I've learned in high school apply to what I'm hearing the scripture say. And we want to know that before we accept the word as true. As we stand before Christ, a simple yearning should describe our motives for kneeling in the blessed assurance that what God gives is all we need. As we rest on our feet, I ask you to return to the childlike encounter. Remember that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that is the amazing grace of the gospel. That we didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it. There was nothing we could do to get it, but God still gave it. And He didn't give it to you at the end when you were successful. He gave it to you when you were insignificant. When you were at the low of lows, the bottom of the barrel. When you felt like nobody loved you, when you felt like you weren't worth anything. When you were dehumanized, when we were dehumanized. God said, you matter. Not just that you matter, I love you. Not just that I love you, I died for you. Not just that I died for you, I rose for you. Not just that I rose for you, I'm coming back for you. It's the grace of the gospel. And we experience that every time we kneel before the Lord as children. Be humble. None of us got it all the way yet. We're not finished the race yet. We're not in the kingdom yet. And there's always room for us to grow. Be humble because growth is a good thing to a child. Growth is healthy for children. How many of us are a child of God? You want to be a child. When it comes to God looking down on you, Lord, look at me like a child. I know the way to sin is death, but I'm trying to get that gift. Lord, look at, look at me in the love of your son, Jesus Christ. Look at me like a child. So I ask that you, if you aren't saved, you would like to experience God as a child. You can surrender now your life is Christ.